Welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much for the wonderful engagement this morning. We can see you all typing away in the chat and in the Q&A. So lots of great questions. And uh, I think we've had quite a good start to the day. We've got now a one and a half hour session under the We Grow, we Grow Community Council. And for this, I would like to hand over the floor directly to Gabriela kostowska Bogeska, who will take us through um, the Community Council and everything that we get have in mind for that. Over to you, Gabriela. Thank you, thank you, Ida. Uh, hello, hello again, everyone. And uh, uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, the, the previous sessions um, and you had a chance to, to, to listen to, to, to the findings of the Bibarometer and to our wonderful uh, advisory board member, Helle. And now you will have a chance to meet some of our community council members. So uh, I do hope that we will be able to bring closer to you uh, parts of the Vigate community so that you have an idea on what we're trying to do and what is our focus for the, for the upcoming period. Um, before I introduce the, the session itself, uh, I just want to say that this session is a result of a joint work of all our community council. And the community council at the moment of the Vigate has 23 members. And they range from large networks of women entrepreneurs to uh, uh, specialized professional organizations that are smaller, but they deal with certain aspects uh, like mentoring, like learning. Uh, so for professionalization of uh, women at the labor market and, uh, and at the business uh, business sector. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the community council members, not only for the summit, but for everything that they have done so far. I would just kindly ask uh, all the all the panelists uh, of today if they can they can mute their microphones so that that we can continue with, with the session. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would also like to say that uh, today I'm happy that I'm joined by almost half of the community council members. So we have around 11 or 10, 11 participants from, from our organizations. They are all renowned organizations. If I start to, to, to talk about uh, what they do as organizations and what uh, uh, their representatives do in their own uh, careers as, as entrepreneurs, professors, researchers, or uh, chairwomen of these uh, different organizations, it will consume most of the time of this session. So I would like to apologize up from to all of you to the audience and to my speakers to our speakers in fact that i'm going to be very brief in the interest of what we want to talk about and what we want to talk about is as the session uh, uh, title suggests is a call for action we would like to talk about what we need to do uh, to provide some recommendations, some messages on what we believe it should be done when it comes to three important areas in the women entrepreneurship ecosystem. One or the first one that we're going to talk about is the evidence-based policy or just women entrepreneurship policy. Uh, then we will move on to the access to finance part and access to funding for women entrepreneurs, because as we heard uh, from the Vibarometer and from many other different studies, it is in fact still number one challenge for women entrepreneurs. And we are going to round up uh, with the digital transformation. We cannot, we cannot, and we should not uh, neglect this very important aspect of, uh, of the women entrepreneurship development process. I do invite you to continue to provide your questions uh, provide your feedback, your suggestions. I will try to follow up as much as possible on your questions and share it with, with our distinguished guest, guests today. But even if we don't manage to answer most of, them, most of them, we will make sure that we're going to take them on board because those are very important in, uh, inputs for us. Because uh, as I suggested at the beginning uh, of uh, our event today, uh, we as a community council, we're going to be very, very much focused on providing uh, solutions based on the inputs from the VGATE community. So do write to us and we will try to, to follow up as much as possible. Now I would like to move on to the first part of our session. We're going to talk about V policy. Uh, B policy in terms, do we need a dedicated policy? How do we approach the women entrepreneurship policy in the conglomerate of the different, uh, different policies and strategies already mentioned? Do we have the preconditions or everything in place for us to have this? 
policy uh, and uh, very, very importantly, touch upon some strategic focuses, what, we, what it should be focused on. And for that, I have the pleasure to present you my first set of guests. Uh, and that's, uh, we have with us today the pleasure of uh, having uh, Mrs. Grazia Rendo, the chairwoman of the Women's Entrepreneurship Platform, Mrs. Sanja Popovic Pantic, the chairwoman of the Sector Group Women Entrepreneurship within Enterprise Europe Network, uh, uh, Mrs. Cheryl Miller, the founding director of the Digital Leadership Institute. Uh, Mrs. Ann Mikkel, the Policy Manager of Women's Enterprise Scotland, and last but definitely not least, Mrs. Ralica Zhekova. She is the Executive Director of the Regional Agency for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, so if uh, what you will, you will notice for not only for our speakers and guests in this session, but for most of the women that, were, that will be presented today, they all wear several hats. So uh, they either have several careers all, all at once, or they have so rich careers so that they can really leverage and talk and, and talk to us about what they think it should be done when it comes to the, to the, to the policy part. When we say Women Entrepreneurship Platform, this is the platform that, uh, among other things, represents our interest in front of the European institutions. It is, in fact, the Secretariat of the uh, Interest Group of Women Entrepreneurship in, in front of the European Parliament. And uh, Grazia is not only chairing this, uh, this platform, but she's also an entrepreneur for, for many, many years now. And I think that gives her an excellent, an excellent point of view on what needs to be done when it comes to re-policy or women entrepreneurship policy, but from different perspectives as an activist, as, a, as someone that advocates the interest of women entrepreneurs, but as an entrepreneur being, being herself an entrepreneur. So I would like to invite Grazia first to, to take the floor and to share with us her, her points of view and the points of view and the stand of the women's entrepreneurship platform when it comes to the women entrepreneurship policy. What do we need to do in, in, in order to have these uh, strategic level changes. So Grazia, uh, welcome. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for joining and please the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriella. Good morning. And I would like to thank you to, for giving me the occasion to speak today. Uh, you asked me to speak about uh, policy, how to improve policy. Uh, and so we would like also to speak about COVID crisis. 19. So COVID crisis has hit seriously women-led companies where business such as retail, trade, touristy sector, hotels, art, childcare and wellness are almost all women-led business. And um, women entrepreneurship is now at the center of their crisis. And we know that almost 50% of SMEs have lost significant revenue and are at a risk of being out of the market. So more women, women entrepreneurship uh, also work to retain an equal footing in the economy, adopting also high care responsibilities. So for this reason, we need a massive a coordinated response now because women could take a leading role in the recovery. We, have, we know about recovery, what's going on. Some countries have suggesting measures, some others are behind of that, like my uh, country of origin, uh, like Italy. So there is a, a mess, let's say, about recovery. And what I can tell you, there isn't a real gender-focused recovery plan. So, but why there is now the, the need to promote women entrepreneurship? Because entrepreneurial potential women is an underexploited source of economic growth and jobs. Women constitute 50% of the European population, but only 34% of self-employed. But globally, there are more than 126 million women entrepreneurs starting or running business. And these women innovate and generate employment opportunities. We need so an actual ecosystem to change, a policy dimension to, of an entrepreneurial ecosystem continue to be underplayed. Ecosystem refers to an important support structure for economic development that provide an extra human, financial and professional resources 
needed for business to survive and grow. But um, the policy can often have a greater impact on smaller business. Gender equality is a core value, as is said, of the EU, a fundamental right of a key principle of a European pillar of social rights. But we need to have a clear strategy with few points, goals, times, and measures. As I mentioned before, recovery plan and especially the legislative proposal are gender blind. There are a lot of funds, they speak about um, uh, digital uh, challenge, they speak about green challenge, uh, but there is any real gender adoption for women. Uh, in the recovery plan, there are a gender contribution to reinforce gender roles and gender norms. We cannot allow that gender will be excluded now in the COVID crisis. More, the next generation EU proposals and projects should have a robust gender impact assessment in the application of gender budgeting in planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation with gender mainstreaming applied to budget and investment. Um, you know, Gabriella, for me, I've always spoken about uh, gender budgeting, gender budgeting, gender budgeting, because I know, for instance, Croatia has, alre has already adopted Iceland, Austria, Andalusia also, with great and successful uh, success. So we need policy implication to take an overall ecosystem strategy. And gender budgeting is a part of this strategy. It's an application of gender mainstreaming in the budgetary process. It's a strategy to achieve gender equality by focusing on how public resources are collected and spent. It includes the gender perspective in all phase in the budget cycle. If we were adopting this strategy, I can tell you the e countries will achieve a rapid improvement in employment, creating more than 10 million of jobs by uh, 10 years, driven more in STEM activities, which could create new jobs and new positions for women. Also, as EU gender pro capita, there will be an improvement by 2.2 percent by 2030. There will be in for EU countries such as Italy, Bulgaria, Belgium, Croatia, a high improvement of 12 percent. In countries where gender is not any longer a problem, problem like France or the others, there will take also benefits from this measure. So if adopted, there will be an increase in the productive system in, in the economy with lower prices and consequently increasing the competitiveness in the international markets. I must say that also EBRD has adopted gender strategy within their band. The strategy was focused to increase women's economy empowerment and equal opportunities, focusing in access to employment opportunities improving finance, access to finance. When gender equality was adopted, also markets became more competitive, understanding women entrepreneurship a real alternative for economic empowerment. So just to tell you that we and women entrepreneurship and WEB, the, the association I chair in Brussels, we called for gender equality to become a consistent a structural part of future of EU strategy. We want to implement the real work-life balance also for women entrepreneurs. We want to promote gender equality also in ACT companies where there will be much room for women and for women entrepreneurs. We call for more women as role models and to increase the number of women in leadership and decision position now also in health sector where there, there are a lot of women working on there. We want more women to be decision market in our future. 
where we are underrepresented in all decision related, for instance, in the crisis. Only adopting clear but effective policy measures all over Europe in each country, not in Austria and nor in Portugal or in Greece, but all over in EU countries with the same strategy, only adopting this measure, women could play an outstanding and fundamental role in the EU economy by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Grazia, so much for, 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 uh, for highlighting the importance of having uh, gender mainstreaming throughout the different policy. And what you just mentioned at the end is very, very important. It's very much in line with the findings of the Bibarometer is that we need to do it in all countries. And we need to improve the conditions everywhere, not only uh, in several countries or only at the European Union levels. I mean, at the European Commission level, we also have to go uh, to the national agencies because as it shows uh, the Bibarometer, women entrepreneurs, more than 70% of them uh, don't believe that they are not properly supported within their national ecosystems. And uh, we, we, we will come back to, to later, maybe to the, to the barriers for not having this uh, Gender, gender budgeting, uh, and different gender components in the in the policies that uh, that have that are being imposed. Now, in the interest of time, I would like to to move on to our next uh, next speaker, Sanja Popovic Pantic from uh, uh, Enterprise Europe Network. Enterprise Europe Network is the largest business support network in uh, I can say not only in Europe but globally. It supports entrepreneurs, not only women entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs from more than sixty countries in uh, uh, growing their businesses and finding international partners. And Sanya is uh, leading one very particular sector group within this, uh, this network. It's the Women Entrepreneurship Sector Group. Uh, she's leading this sector group since 2015, which is, uh, which is very good uh, for uh, making not only uh, more accessible the services to the women entrepreneurs, but also making the network itself more gender sensitive. And at the same time, Sanya has been managing for more than two decades the National Association of Women Entrepreneurs in Serbia, and she's a researcher. So her daily job is basically one of her daily jobs is female researcher at one very large and renowned private research institute. So Sanya, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, give us your points of view uh, on what uh, we policy should be all about. Thank you, Gabriela, very much for your nice introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, Grazia, as well, for a, a very uh, comprehensive uh, overview on the policy um, state of the play regarding the, the treat, treatment uh, of uh, uh, gender uh, issue. Uh, I would uh, fully agree with uh, uh, Grazia that uh, um, the policies uh, are not uh, enough uh, uh, genderized, let's say, or that they are even more gender blinded uh, in many aspects. Uh, and therefore, I find as a very important issue uh, the lack of the appropriate uh, definition of the women enterprise. So uh, many of the uh, problems uh, and uh, probably the gender uh, blindness uh, uh, comes uh, from the fact that we do not have uh, actually unique uh, uh, definition of the uh, women enterprise when we speak of course about uh, women entrepreneurship. Um, and um, uh, for example, uh, the, the most prevailing uh, definition uh, is uh, the one uh, uh, provided by UN Women, uh, which uh, actually consider uh, as women uh, enterprise uh, the uh, uh, entity which uh, is owned 51% uh, by a woman uh, and uh, one or more women. Uh, whose management and day-to-day -day operations are controlled by one or more women and that is operated independently from other non-women owned businesses and where a woman uh, is also signatory of the company's legal accounts, accounts and that is operated independently from other non-women owned businesses. I need, needed to read uh, the definition. Uh, just to be clear on what is actually uh, prevailing uh, definition uh, uh, of in many of uh, our countries. Uh, but uh, I find uh, not only me, but uh, also um, uh, 
uh, I'm happy that it is recognized uh, even at the uh, international level that this uh, definition uh, is uh, uh, in many aspects uh, actually um, neglecting uh, the uh, endeavor of uh, women uh, who are uh, uh, deeply involved in managing of the uh, company with uh, less than 50% of the uh, capital, uh, which is uh, um, very much aligned with the gender stereotypes uh, in uh, many countries uh, in the world. Uh, so what to do with the, that uh, situation and how to not to be uh, uh, discri discriminatory against uh, this uh, uh, huge uh, uh, pool of uh, uh, women uh, entrepreneurs uh, only because uh, they are not owning uh, uh, more than 30% uh, uh, of the capital uh, due to the gender stereotypes in their uh, cultures. Um, I'm happy that the uh, International Trade Center, together with the Swedish uh, um, Organization for Standards, uh, launched a uh, uh, huge debate uh, which is ongoing uh, and uh, which will uh, be added uh, on 14 and 16 uh, December, uh, so um, next week. Actually, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I hope that it will result in uh, the um, definition that respects uh, diversity of the cultures uh, where women entrepreneurs are operating. Uh, so, um, uh, I would like to share with you a few of the, um, I see key uh, uh, the, the messages from, from this discussion that will be further on discussed uh, on the workshops next, uh, next week, uh, where uh, the, this initiative recognize, uh, recognizes uh, a few uh, categories of of uh, women's, uh, women's companies. So first is a, a women-owned business, uh, and uh, this is recognized exactly as UN women uh, with the, the criteria of 51% of ownership uh, uh, running the business uh, and, uh, and other uh, criteria that I uh, mentioned in, in the definition. Second is women-led business, which respects uh, uh, the fact that uh, businesses could be owned less than 50%, uh, but uh, fully uh, led and uh, um, controlled by, uh, by uh, women. Uh, then there is women governed uh, businesses, uh, which respect the fact that women are members of, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of the board or they are CEO, uh, uh, act actively involved in the businesses. Um, so it is uh, also very important uh, uh, category, and then uh, I wouldn't say less important, but not maybe in the, in the so important when we speak about access to uh, to funds, uh, women-led cooperative, uh, uh, women-led informal enterprises. Uh, so um, uh, why this in general? Why this uh, uh, is uh, important to define uh, strictly? and maybe more broadly, uh, women's businesses. Uh, it's all about access to fine, uh, funds and uh, access to financial resources, uh, uh, which are um, at the moment uh, very strict. So uh, my message would be that we should really advocate, advocate for not to be strict uh, uh, um, uh, against women uh, businesses, uh, which are um, uh, less uh, owned uh, uh, by women, less than 50%, because uh, we, um, we, we know that in many countries, uh, 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 women, women business uh, is uh, actually um, run uh, by uh, women, but also, uh, and that uh, the, old, the percentage of ownership shouldn't be discriminatory criteria. Um, uh, having in mind that the, the financial resource is uh, uh, very, very uh, narrow at the moment. Uh, and with this additional criteria, uh, uh, we put another uh, barrier uh, to, to women to access that finances. Uh, another issue that I would uh, like to raise uh, uh, today is uh, uh, also uh, one more um, 
issue, which is discussed uh, at this forum uh, of uh, International Faith Center and uh, and the St St Swedish uh, Standard uh, Organization. Uh, uh, it is a challenge uh, to define women-owned business if uh, they uh, diluted by investment. What does it mean? <laughs> Uh, it means uh, actually if uh, uh, women uh, as a leader of the company is uh, capable to attract the investment and uh, that investment uh, can, come to, uh, comes to the company, uh, it uh, diluted the, the, uh, the ownership of the capital. And then uh, it comes the question, is it that uh, a company should be considered uh, as a female company if the investors uh, was men. I don't think it's fair to discuss this uh, question, uh, especially if that company was uh, uh, owned by women more than uh, 50% before. Uh, so um, uh, I would uh, also uh, send the, the message that we, as a, as a forum today, should uh, uh, advocate uh, for for uh, not to uh, uh, be so uh, strict uh, again against women we as women uh, and to support the idea uh, to keep uh, uh, the uh, consideration of that uh, company uh, that was capable to attract uh, investment no matter the, the gender to be considered as as a, as a female company so that's from my uh, side today thanks a lot Thank you, thank you, Sanya. We will definitely come back to some of the aspects in the access to finance part. I would just like to to, to thank you for um, uh, sharing the information on the on the work that is undergoing for women enterprises definition. Uh, I think that this is very valuable valuable uh, job that has been done under the auspice of the uh, Swedish Standards uh, Institute and the, uh, and the International Trade Center because I believe that this is truly a historical moment because finally we will have definitions and it is not only one definition as you mentioned there will be several definitions uh, we are also taking part in this in this workshop uh, next week and we will make sure to, to share all the information with the big community once we have it the final idea is to have these definitions standardized by the according to the iso standard and hopefully we really hope that this will enable a, a largely largely will facilitate the international uh, statistics and comparisons and finally to know what we mean uh, behind the women entrepreneur what does a women enterprise mean so that we can work on it and also i agree on all the other aspects that you mentioned that we really have to have to be very careful on uh, not to exclude women uh, in, in access to finance just based on some some percentages or some criteria but we will we will talk about that later on now i would like to come back to the to the policy aspects and i would like to invite cheryl to share her points of view with us she is uh, uh, in fact uh, the digital pioneer and uh, she has been advocating for more than 10 years or even more uh, uh, when it comes to digital transformation something that we are very much focusing in the lately but she has been she has been living for this uh, for, for many many years now and the digital leadership institute has been in fact uh, recognized for its leadership in 2019 by the by google and financial times and many many other things i just want to and um, to, to say thank you cheryl for joining us and i'm Really, really looking forward to, to what what uh, you have to you you had to uh, you you can say on the topic of women entrepreneurship policy. Thank you. I think I'm blushing, but it's so dark here <laughs> in Northern California. Hopefully, you can't see that. Mostly, I'm really um, happy to be here. Of course, you know this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, as are all of you and everything that you're doing. So, thank you, Gabriela, for bringing us together under the auspices of this project, which is um, really critical, of course. And I think my recommendations for policy are really in that direction. Um, so I, I, I have a very short list. I'm gonna go through it really quickly, um, but I, it's also meant to be food for thought for us to kind of get more about our capacity building at a European level to have the infrastructure and to have the resources in terms of people, in terms of budget, in terms of money, in terms of priority on the question of women's entrepreneurship or women and entrepreneurship or women-led enterprise or however you want to 
define it. And indeed, it's a very thorny question that does have to be um, resolved without excluding women, obviously. So one of the things, a question that I floated in the opening keynotes was, I, I know for a long time that the number of policy analysts in the European Commission who are dedicated specifically to the question of women's entrepreneurship is maybe half of one person, maybe. And this has been the story for at least the, the time that I've been active on this subject, so 10 years. Um, and that one third of one person is extremely busy, as you can imagine. And I find this highly problematic. So from out of this project, I would like to see a recommendation that we actually have full-time equivalents of a decent representative proportion based on what our priority is and what the contribution is of women leading enterprise to the European economy not only what it is today, but what its potential is, and let's see some corresponding investment in terms of policy analysts um, inside the commission that will then give us the framework, at least the resources to start building a, um, a, a, a well thought out path um, and give us the channel to start um, creating policy around women's entrepreneurship. So to, and then to that question, um, I really think that we should set our sights on something like a Women and Entrepreneurship Act. I've been saying this probably for three, four years, maybe longer. Um, I'm, and now I'm gonna make a reference to the United States where you know I all am right now and guilty of being American, but also guilty of being Belgian. Um, in this country, uh, such a thing has existed since 1986. And I know it's a delicate question when you're talking about um, national sovereignty and the subsidiarity principle in Europe. But again, to get all of our duckies in a row, I think it's very important for us to have this kind of landmark act that gives us um, not only the prior that the priority has been set on promoting and supporting women's uh, entrepreneurship, but also the cross-cutting opportunity to access resources and access people throughout the European Commission to be building policy, to be um, answering some of these other questions that our illustrious group here, including Grazia in the opening, mentioned. Um, related to that, of course, and now I'm going to start to split hairs between, you know, what is the WeGate project doing and what do we need to be doing more long-term? But um, I, I come back again to the US example where um, in that, uh, you know, Small Business Women-Led Entrepreneurship Act from 1986, they also launched something called the Women's Business Center Network. Could this be WEP? Could this be uh, WeGate? In the United States, there are now 300 such agencies that are local, that are serving women. They're part of the small business um, associations, usually chamber of commerce or, or whatnot, um, but they are supported at the federal level, which I want to also emphasize. So this would mean European funding going into those organizations on the national level, on the, on the local, regional, even city level. Um, and this kind of begs the question, um, who are they or, and where are they now? Because certainly we've all, we all represent organizations um, and people who are in, engaged on this topic right now. And I think that makes us ask, well, if, you know, whether we don't need some kind of stakeholder mapping of that kind. So who are those organizations? Maybe this has been done a zillion times. Is it in the project? If it isn't, it needs to be a project. Um, then I'm gonna, just a couple of things. Oh, and while I'm at it, how about structural funding for such a network organization on the European level? So we have the European Institute for Gender Equality, we have um, EASNI, we have all the other associations. Frankly, just like all of the organizations that are supporting women, um, it's all self-funded. It's all, I'm, I'm, no, I'm preaching to the choir here. The, when, um, when our energy runs out and the money runs out, that's the end of it. 
And this is not a sustainable solution to addressing the underlying problems that uh, women entrepreneurs are facing. So I, I think we should also ask for a structurally funded agency at the European level that is addressing and promoting women's entrepreneurship that then has the, the, the mission to support those local national um, um, agencies all across Europe. Then two kind of nitty gritty things that I think often fall off the, off the radar, which is what can the European Commission do right now that will actually boost and support women entrepreneurs? And I think um, the, the question of procurement, so diversity in supply chains, diversity in distribution chains, chains setting targets at the European level for the number of women-led entrepreneurs that women-led businesses that would be getting procurement money um, that will even be receiving um, framework funding from the European Commission. Let's not, um, let's not self-censor, let's really go for it and ask these kinds of things. And also the, the commission, I think, setting the bar for private enterprise as well because this is the cha challenge besides getting access to funding. It's just having clients, people who are buying our products, people who, who are using our services and the, the public sector should not be the end all and be all, but they should definitely be setting the example. And that's because we are European taxpayers. And it is a fact that a disproportionate amount of procurement money goes to male-led enterprise, a disproportionate amount of the support for enterprise is going to men. So I would like to also, you know, see these statistics and say, you know, um, no, no represent or what is the what's the <laughs> again the the Boston Tea Party? No taxation without representation. As long as we're putting money in the game, we should be getting our fair share of money out of the game. And there, end of rant, I'm done. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Cheryl, inspirational as always, but, but thank you for, for, for pointing out uh, uh, the need for, 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 for this act. Uh, and uh, I had the pleasure to be to be in touch lately with with Virginia Littlejohn, one of the ladies behind the the US Act, and it's a it's a real pleasure to talk to her about the experiences. And we will definitely dig into that a little bit more as as we as we continue uh, con continue our uh, uh, discussions within the within the council. And also for pointing out the public procurement as one of the strategic focuses. So we cannot talk about all the all the the the, the, the parts of this new policy that it should be about women entrepreneurship, but definitely the things about the, the business centers, the structural funding, and of course, uh, the parts related to, to the public procurement and the, the role of women entrepreneurs in that sense. So thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. We will, we will be talking to you again later on, of course, and not, not to forget the digital part. <laughs> we are counting on you in that part as well. Uh, now I would like, uh, thank you. I would like to, to invite uh, Anne Mikkel, the, the she, uh, we, we have to have a, a real, a real policy expert. Uh, she is a policy manager at the, uh, at the Women's Enterprise Scotland. So uh, this is a community interest group dedicated to women entrepreneurs in Scotland, but also has a has a wider, wider experience. And she is uh, like like all of our speakers today. She is uh, wearing different hats. She's also having her own company. Uh, has been working on many policy development processes within uh, within Women's Enterprise. Scotland. Scotland. She is also a trustee uh, at uh, one institute for uh, uh, small business. Uh, so she's also a researcher and she can bring that perspective in our discussion as well. So Anne, thank you very much for joining and looking, looking forward to your inputs. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriella. And uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. Um, and Oh, wow. Yes, Cheryl, Women's Entrepreneurship Act. We are absolutely up for that. So that is something that I've written in bold. So I'll be out there trying to be promoting that with the next Scottish Parliament, I think. Um, I just want to say um, briefly some thoughts about um, Scotland as um, a devolved nation of the United Kingdom and what we are doing, because in Scotland it would appear 
in policy terms that what we are doing um, we're, is, is quite well in, in comparison to other nations in that we've had a national policy framework for women's enterprise since 2014. It was updated in 2017 and that was co-authored by ourselves at Women's Enterprise Scotland in partnership with the Scottish Government. And the key elements of that framework are measurement, of course, and the importance of collating and analysing data to inform policy decisions, mentoring and networking as a means of building social capital for women, as well as combating isolation, the importance of role models and visible, relevant, real examples of women in business, supporting growth and finance, and also developing gender aware business support and best practice within economic development agencies and also other business support agencies. So to supplement that, an action group was set up, um, which meets four times a year. This is chaired by a Scottish Government Minister and facilitated by Scottish Government staff. So that all sounds good so far. However, <laughs> we could do so much better in Scotland. The number of women-led employer businesses in Scotland actually declined um, to 15.5% in 2018. And while the National Business Support Organisation Business Gateway reported that women-led businesses were 50% of new startup um, businesses, that's not translating into a greater stock of women-led businesses. Um, so the leaky pipeline is definitely there. And as of last year, there were only nine women-led scale-ups existing in Scotland. So what does that mean in terms of where we're at with our policy framework? So what we really need to ensure is a proper status for this framework. It has to be fully integrated into the policy and legislative framework. And that means into economic policy, procurement policy, our national performance frameworks, our data gathering frameworks, and even into areas such as education policy to, to look at the tackling of occupational segregation. We need to make women's enterprise policy part of what we might call the gender architecture really in Scotland, because we are we're just not there yet. Um, and I heard earlier about, you know, it's not about fixing the women, it's about fixing the system. And that's definitely what we are, we are trying to do. Because women's enterprise is still not accepted as an area of economic priority, despite the research on the economic contribution of such businesses to the Scottish and the wider UK economy. So government really has to start prioritising resources, including financial resources, to the implementation of our policy framework with some timescales and actions and much clearer lines about accountability. We also need better quality, equality impact assessment of all business support systems and also of other national and local funding initiatives and infrastructure developments, because these equality impact assessments should really be providing the data and driving improvements. Um, and we're, we're just not seeing that. We need more positive action initiatives and certainly what we are calling for is a National Women's Business Centre um, to support much better implementation of our framework. Um, and of course, alongside that, of course, we all need political leadership and political commitment at the end of the day. And we know that the pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in our economic and also our social systems and really highlighted and sharpened all of those already existing inequalities and the pre-existing barriers for women in enterprise. And this has really meant that despite the policy frameworks, the government enterprise support has still failed to recognise the additional challenges faced by millions of women-led businesses. Equality simply can't wait until the pandemic passes because the coronavirus has actually caused much greater inequality too. So now is really the time to, to push for much further 
integrated policy support, which is what we're trying to do. So we have Scottish parliamentary elections in May 2021. So our call to action includes the implementation still, obviously, of aspects of our framework and around access to finance, gender aware support, improved enterprise education, improved data, um, also pushing where we have um, a fairly active gender budgeting group in, in Scotland as well. So we're trying to push that approach, all of which is part of the solution towards a far much more gender equal economy. We're calling on the government to bring us and women entrepreneurs to the policy table, as it really is the only way we can develop the ecosystem that supports women to develop successful and sustainable businesses, and also to avoid that poverty level um, self-employment that, that so many women are in. So to sum up and to paraphrase Maya Angelou really, as well as ask asking for what we want. We do have to be prepared to get it. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Anne, for sharing all, the, all this different information and very, very valuable. And I, I, I'm, I'm following on the on the chat and I, I cannot agree more with Liva saying that uh, it's a great point that gender equality cannot be postponed due to COVID-19. And I do agree that I believe that this is the uh, I'm not trying to, to say that uh, things were not happening before us. Uh, of course not. We just want to leverage on that. But I believe that this is the right moment to push, to push a little bit further. But as you mentioned we have to ask for it but we also have to be prepared for what is for, 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 for getting it uh, but in any case I also I also want to highlight one of the things that you mentioned in uh, uh, in your speech and that is the importance of, of data I think that uh, we are uh, in most of the cases we are lacking lacking data when it comes to women entrepreneurs we don't have a regular statistics that we can use uh, for the policy for the instruments for all the different aspects that we want to do so if we want to have a, a either gender budgeting or gender 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 components in different programs I believe that besides having the, uh, the definition, we also another prerequisite should be a regular regular statistics collected uh, in all countries and then used uh, for, for comparable purposes. And I think that that is something also that we should pursue in our in our attempts as a community council. Uh, so thank you, Anne. And I would like to introduce uh, now Radica Zhekova, uh, the, the director of the regional agency for uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And um, it is, uh, this uh, agency is particular itself because it represents uh, an ecosystem in a, in a nutshell, because it combines local authorities, uh, central authorities, NGOs, businesses, even uh, private persons. So it is uh, ha having this uh, ecosystem perspective what makes uh, Ralitza even, even more interesting as our, as our speaker, but also her, her vast experience in supporting SMEs and in leading women in business uh, programs within the agency. So, uh, so Ralitza, please. Is, uh, looking forward to, to, to hearing your thoughts on uh, women entrepreneurship policy aspects. Thank you for joining and the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriela. After so many good messages, I, I hope that uh, I will just focus uh, your attention on two that we together with our partners and the Women in Business Project actually develop under the policy ag agenda that we prepared. And taking the words uh, from uh, Grazia that we, of course, need uh, institutions on European level. We need uh, some centers on European level. I would like to point out that also we should act locally, as Gabriela pointed out. And uh, one of our main findings was that actually uh, in the countries that we, we included under the program, uh, there is no single governmental body responsible for women entrepreneurship. Why is that? Because uh, generally uh, it is considered that this is a typical intergovernmental topic and uh, it includes several ministries that might uh, deal with it. So be it the Ministry of uh, Economy, be it the Ministry of Labor or Education and Science. So basically, uh, what we saw as an option for improving uh, the status of female entrepreneurs, uh, of course, there's several possibilities that we uh, actually listed. Um, 
we would like to point out that maybe it's a good idea to have national strategies and uh, also implementation plans. And within these plans, we see it is very important to have a clear link to governmental budgets, to programs and projects that uh, need to be supported. So uh, it can be done by an intergovernmental body that can be established um, um, within the structure of a certain institution. It might be working group or consultation body. It might be a directorate for women entrepreneurship within the Ministry of Economy. But I think that every country needs a, a specific body dealing with this uh, uh, topic. And of course, um, the main role for such a structure we see uh, as a supervision of uh, the preparation of the women entrepreneurial national strategy. And the second uh, role may be the supervision of the preparation of the implementation plan. So, um, of course, this is only one way uh, to coordinate this, but uh, I think it's a viable proposal. And one, uh, one other issue that was not touched by uh, the panelists now, but uh, was touched by the panelists uh, in the panel before, uh, we think that also we need uh, a strategy that uh, aims to harmonize the business environment with the family environment and support and re relieve women in caring for children, elderly parents, family, and so on and so forth. So basically, we need uh, to support female entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship and uh, the policy makers first uh, must ensure that their family and tax policies support women overall participation in the labor market. So, of course, th this might include different um, measures like elimination of negative economic incentives to work um, in tax and benefit system. Also, it might um, include the creation of a supportive infrastructure for women workers and entrepreneurs with care responsibilities. And uh, also, um, one proposal uh, we need more targeted measures uh, that can be taken in order to, to, to ensure that family, social and fiscal policies do not discriminate against women entrepreneurs. So, um, also another important issue, and with that I will stop, uh, that needs to be addressed by the policy makers is childcare. And mothers need to become more flexible, and this can only be achieved through an appropriate policy framework, of course. Uh, but in order to reconcile work and private life, measures have to be, uh, have to be taken um, in order to provide affordable and quality care facilities. For children and other dependents, of course, elderly and so on and so forth. Uh, so this also might include uh, inclusion of flexible working hours in order to enable parents and carers to co contribute to um, actually creating a good work-life balance. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ralitza, so much for, for, point, for, for uh, stressing the importance of the work-life balance. This is a very, very, very big challenge for all of us women entrepreneurs. And uh, in fact, we really have to work on those aspects. Uh, so there are so many different strategic focuses for, for women entrepreneurship development, but we should, in order to be successful, uh, choose some of them and try to solve one by one uh, and uh, to try to find the, the, the ones that are the, the, the top priority. And for that, we will, of course, uh, look at the needs of our women entrepreneurs and see what are the first a couple of priorities that we need to address, but definitely life uh, work life balance is number one. And uh, um, also, what you mentioned is very important coordination. Uh, we can talk about different policies, we can talk about uh, data, we can talk about definitions, but if we don't have a coordination body, regardless on which on which level, at national or at the EU level, we the, and of course there is there should be enough resources devoted in terms of uh, uh, men uh, in terms of sorry persons and and of course uh, money for, for that coordination purposes so thank you very much for pointing out that that important aspect as well 
And for having that said, I would like now in the interest of time to move on to our next topic about access to finance, not only access to finance, but also funding. Uh, and uh, we, we want to look at it uh, from its broadest perspective. So it's not only public funding, but also what happens with alternative sources of funding. Uh, what can be done in order for the women entrepreneurs to have better access to, to, to resources for, for their business? And uh, do we really need to insist so much on that scalability? I, I, I agree with, uh, with what was said in the previous, uh, previous panel is that, of course, uh, we don't have anything against growth. And I, I personally, I would like to be a unicorn. Why not? But I mean, at the end of the day, there are so many women entrepreneurs that just want to make, uh, to make a decent living and to be economically independent. And should we or should we not try to avoid this trap of scalability and many, many other aspects that I would like uh, to, 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 to take to the table today in our discussion. And for that, we will have some of, uh, some of the speakers from uh, that, that I already introduced, but also, we have with us some, some other members of our community council. So I will start with presenting Lynn uh, Caden Head. She is the chairwoman of the Women's Enterprise uh, Scotland. Uh, and uh, she, um, she is, I think it's the right person to, to, to start the panel with because she is uh, not only a serial entrepreneur, a professor, but also an investor. So she can bring in that, that perspective in, uh, in, in our discussion today. So Lynn, thank you very much for joining and looking forward to, to kicking off the, the discussion on the access to finance and funding for women entrepreneurs. Thank you, Gabriella, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm also chair of Women's Enterprise Scotland, and you heard from my colleague uh, Anne, Anne Miko earlier on, as Gabriella said, business angel investor, entrepreneur, and more importantly, an absolutely passionate believer in the power of entrepreneurialism to transform the lives of not only individuals, but of our societies. Um, in the interest of time, I'll move through, through this quite quickly. I have uh, four key points to make, but uh, just before we get into them, first of all, I'd like to say that um, what we actually need to do is really get real about the issue that we are facing. Let's start with some harsh realities. Uh, you've heard some of the research before. Uh, women ask for one third less capital when they start their businesses. We need to encourage them to ask for more. They pay themselves less and they pay themselves last. This is not helpful for women in terms of leading their businesses. They start with 53% less capital. And most importantly, and the most worrying statistic of all, the research in the UK shows that women-led teams get one pence in every pound of venture capital. Um, so putting it another way, men get 99 times more funding than women for scaling businesses. And if that's not signs of serious systemic market failure in supporting our women entrepreneurs, I'm not sure what is. Um, we actually know what the issues are. We've known what the issues are in terms of access to funding for women entrepreneurs for many, many years, decades in fact. We know what the problem is. What we actually need, need is concerted action to sort things out. So the four key points um, that I would like to talk about, and Gabrielle's alluded to, to the first one, is, is about the life cycles of businesses and avoiding this tra trap of scalability. Thriving economies everywhere need businesses of all sizes, all shapes, and in all sectors. So we should not be focusing on supporting just the scaling businesses. And let's also remember that when we look at tech companies, um, the average uh, valuation at exit for a tech company is 40 million. Why are we all simply chasing these unicorns? We need all sorts of uh, types of companies. So we need to really drill down on the types of financial support and also recognize the differences between the support and funding that is needed for micro businesses and also SMEs. A micro business of up to 10 employees has completely different requirements for an SME with up to 250 50 employees. And I think one of the most important and useful uh, innovations in this area in terms of funding for women entrepreneurs has been the growth in crowdfunding. The research also shows that uh, women are more successful in crowdfunding. Um, and this is actually partly to do because at that very early stage when crowdfunding is appropriate, whether it's donation-based, equity-based um, or um, 
uh, rewards based. What is actually much more important at that stage is authenticity, trust and passion not necessarily the business skills. So I'd really like to see um, a grow, uh, much more growth in terms of uh, women-specific crowdfunding platforms. And we have a very good example of a crowdfunding platform in the UK that has been supported by one of our uh, major banking organizations. The second point I'd really like to make is around the importance of gender lens investing. Let's remind ourselves that women are not risk averse. We actually have advanced risk awareness. We might be debt averse, but we are certainly not um, uh, uh, risk averse. And what we need to do is encourage all investors when they are looking at businesses to invest in, to look at the proposal initially on the basis of what they have, and then apply a gender lens over the investment criteria. Is the woman asking for enough business? Have we taken into account the time scales? Because we understand that women actually take a little bit longer sometimes to get to where they want to be. A male led business might get there in two years, a woman might get there in three years. We need to factor that in through, through the gender, gender lens over, over the investment. And around this, we absolutely do need women specific venture capital funds. No more excuses, let's just get them, get, let them get set up. And then finally, things will only really change when we have more women investors making the investment decisions and actually writing their own checks to invest in companies, hence the need uh, to, to grow the number of women business angels. So for example, I'm also chair of Mint Ventures, which is a woman led uh, business angel group. And uh, that that uh, we, we've just really started off here and that's been very useful because we're going to apply gender lenses over this. Um, one of the things that we do also have in the UK, which has encouraged more business angels to invest in business is enterprise investment tax relief schemes. Perhaps we can start looking at that at a more European level as well. Um, um, so I think that would be useful. The third point is the importance of tone, language and pitching when we are encouraging women entrepreneurs to, to raise capital for their businesses. And we have to be very cognizant of the different cultures in different countries. The pitching process that we have comes from the American culture. This is actually not really appropriate for many countries. It's quite detrimental and quite puts off a number of women entrepreneurs. So we are encouraging um, investors in Scotland um, to move away from the pitching process. And let's try and work on different ways that we can get the women's messages across. Uh, the final point that I'd really like to make is in terms of the importance of governments in terms of access to fun funding. Now, an awful lot of grants are available, which are very helpful for, for businesses, but grants are very much focused on creating jobs. And actually, an entrepreneurial business does not need to create large numbers of jobs at the early stage. And we have to look at how grants are assessed and given to businesses, perhaps not by dictating that they can be given um, around the number of jobs that are created, but let's actually look at the valuations that are being created in the companies instead. The system that we have at this point in time is a relatively stale, ecosystem of support that simply rep represents one typically male way of doing business. So we can we can change it with some of the things that we, we've focused on here. As has also been said before, let's focus on the economic impact. This is so important. We can look at developing codes to help invest in women. And finally, let's remember that women are 51% of the population. They control over 40% of the world's assets. And if we don't all collectively invest more support in helping more women to invest in more women-led businesses, whether that's through business angel investment, assessing the grants, venture capital investment, different instruments of debt finance, if we don't do that, we all suffer. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for, for, for pointing out uh, 
you, you raised so many, so many important aspects, uh, starting from the need for gender lenses. Uh, not to mention uh, how, how much we are lacking behind when it comes to number of female investors. Some studies show that it's less than 8% when it comes to women, women as investors or as business angels. So, so really it has a lot of, a lot of work, uh, work ahead of us. But I would also like to, to, to um, uh, take one question now at this moment uh, with you, Lynn. Um, we have a question from the audience. Uh, what is uh, what is your what is a suggested alternative to to the pitching culture? What do you think it should be done instead of instead of using the the, the, the pitching approach? So, so actually, I refer back to the time where I worked in venture capital, and the investment executive used to work uh, very closely with the entrepreneur. And uh, they would create the proposal and it was actually the investment executive that would present on behalf of the entrepreneur to the investment committee. That's one way of looking at it. And we can uh, also look more at um, just a more a bit of a kind of fireside chat process. Um, it's really helping the entrepreneur understanding how they want to present their business in a manner that makes them feel comfortable. It'd be really good to explore, um, you know, with the panel later, any other suggestions as to how we can take that forward. But the pitching process doesn't work. As an investor, I don't want to invest in people that are good at pitching. I want to invest in good businesses. No, thank, 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 thank you, Lynn, uh, for, for sharing this. And I, I, I cannot agree more. I mean, I personally... Uh, I can hardly find myself uh, in a position to, to, to pitch my ideas. I can present my ideas, but I cannot. I cannot really go go into that uh, into that talk. Maybe maybe I have a I have a stereotype as well. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or a prejudice but in any case thank you very much and we will definitely have a look at this and there are some suggestions in the chat some recommendations from other from other organizations and other uh, access to finance organizations that can also be very useful to to, to, to be checked out uh, connected to the pitching process and how to prepare for this um, uh, for investments and the like then uh, now I would like to to ask again Cheryl Cheryl if it's, you're here I guess uh, if you can uh, share some thoughts uh, with us regarding access to finance as well. Yeah, I would first like to definitely um, give a shout out to Lynn for all of that, es especially because I'm literally now living just over the hill from Silicon Valley. And it's something that I've been preaching for a very long time. And that is Europe should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, this is the social democratic ideal that we are living and enjoying in Europe. Well, I'm not anymore. Um, and I think the kind of um, Peter Pan syndrome, Silicon VC, um, Silicon Valley VC mentality is not appropriate for the majority of the word, world, not even appropriate as a growth model for the United States, let alone for Europe. So something that I've been really pushing for a long time, I think that we should all get into this language is a feminine growth model which is, I'm not saying a woman's growth model, but it does resonate with the way women think and the way we run business. And that is something that is focused on slow, incremental, positive, and sustainable growth. And if you want, you can toss out the last word because growth is even relative, right? When you're doing all those other things. So, and I think if anywhere in the world that um, that kind of thinking is, has a place for discussion and to um, embrace that is that is Europe. And I think Europe can even lead on that subject and teach things back to the rest of the world. So that's a little bit of the preachy part of my message. Um, but again, and also focusing on fixing the system and not the women. Some of the things we know from, um, from research is that women get loans when they ask for loans from women. So there's a whole, um, gender equality um, action that is necessary within banking and finance. And some of that we do see. Um, there's someone in uh, a woman named Claire Goding in um, Belgium, who's been working on that subject for quite some time with great success, 
with BNP Paribas. So if anyone is looking for an example to emulate on a, on a European level, um, but then just something, um, yes, ask, tell women to ask for more money. Yeah, I think that's definitely good, good advice overall. But then I would uh, again, look back at the system. Um, why are we uh, pushing women towards microfinance, for example? Why is that the answer from the EBRD and you know, the European Investment Bank? Um, and why is that then ticking the box vis-a-vis -vis women entrepreneurs? So no, it should not be men, finance, women, microfinance. That is simply not okay. Um, and then just around the whole discussion of um, include, uh, I'm sorry, yes, inclusive finance. Am I getting the word right? Inclusive finance. Um, let's not forget the link with digital because um, this may not be as much the situation in Europe, but, but I think it, it is important to be sensitive to the fact that finance is so intricately linked with the digital tools that we need to access it, to make applications, to get money, to have money on, you know, on our phones. Um, and so that, that discussion, which we're gonna take up later, we should definitely keep in mind when we're talking about um, inclusive finance. Also that the majority of the unbanked in the world are women. Um, and certainly the same question in Europe. So if you don't have a bank account, you might not even have an ID card. Um, how do you start up your business? How do you get, how do you get your business going? How do you keep it going? Um, and then also not to leave out, um, because I, I also tend to find that um, those, um, uh, you know, the self-financing platforms, the GoFundMe and such, starts to smack a little bit of a gender ghetto. So I, I, I understand its role in certain stages of, of economic growth of an enterprise, but I don't want that to be where women get stuck. And on the other end of the discussion that we should be looking at Bitcoin and we should be looking at um, developments in FinTech where there are definitely opportunities for us to leapfrog with technology, for example, to leapfrog the traditional financing and banking infrastructures where there are a lot of impediment, impediments that women face. Um, and I think for the rest, I, I just, uh, oh, one, uh, one other small point. And that is, um, you know, those numbers on the number, the, the number of women scale ups organizations that are that uh, are out there to take advantage of bigger capital you know uh, venture capital um, and you know the next phase of financing this to me is also a systemic issue with not getting women into startup so we don't have enough women at the opening of the of the um, pipeline to have them there later at scale up and it is really important, and I think our Scottish colleagues here have put their uh, put their thumb on the on the pulse of the of the discussion. And and this is something that we all know, but maybe greater granularity is required to understand what a woman needs for finance and funding, depending on the scale of her operation, and also to ensure well two things: first, that we're getting more women into startup. Okay, so that's a, a, maybe a discussion for later as well, um, but also that we understand what kind of tools that she needs at each um, at each stage of that journey, um, and also that she understands what those um, financing and funding opportunities are at each stage. Yes, th thank you, Cheryl. Indeed, that that is one of the one of the core uh, uh, core objectives of what we what we are striving for is to secure access to finance and funding for women at, ev at for every stage of their development process. So it's not only for the scaling, but also making sure that they have the right assets at hand for different for different phases. And I I very much like what you just mentioned, the gender ghetto. We don't want 
to, 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 to enter in any of our discussions on any of our aspects, policy or, or digital transformation or access to finance in a, in a, in a ghetto. We just want to, to, be, uh, to find a way to make gender sensitive uh, um, components in the different aspects that we need for the entrepreneurial journey. So thank you very much for, 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 for those, uh, for all the different tools that you, that you just uh, presented. We will definitely take them on board for, for our later discussions within the council. Now I would like to introduce to you one more um, uh, panelist in, in the access to finance part, and that's Stella Kasdagli. She is the co-founder of the Women on Top professional organization that supports women entrepreneurs in uh, their professional development through mentoring, learning. And uh, she is also you know, a diverse person, a journalist, a writer. She has written a couple of books. Uh, she has established several mentoring uh, networks, including a network for mentoring teenagers. Uh, so, so many, many different things she has been involved in, and uh, she is here to, to share sh to share with us a couple of thoughts on what uh, what can be done to improve access to finance for women entrepreneurs. So, Stella, thank you very much for joining, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here uh, today uh, with us. So, um, before I begin, just a, a short introduction that uh, about something that happened uh, yesterday and something that has been happening for for the last nine or ten months. I've, I've lost account, to be honest. Um, so, uh, in Greece and and I'm sure in other parts of the of uh, of Europe and the world as well. Uh, there is a great uh, overrepresentation of women in, in small um, entrepreneurship in the fields that have been mostly struck by COVID, by the pandemic, and that is tourism, retail, and um, um, the, 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 the hospitality industry in general, uh, food and beverage as well. Uh, so we, we are in a position that not only we cannot go back and uh, uh, let our, our efforts um, down, but we also need to accelerate those efforts. And uh, yesterday we were holding a, a speed mentoring event for uh, a small and medium entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. And uh, there was uh, one of the mentors who uh, was sharing a story about her difficulty uh, to access finance when she was uh, first starting out about 10 years ago and she said well hopefully things uh, have changed now and it was really um you know sobering to see about uh, 30 women on the on the zoom uh window uh nodding and, and smiling in a in a, in a wry smiles um indicating that things have not changed at all over the, the last 10 years uh, with regards to uh, female entrepreneurs' uh, access to finance. So um, I think that I, I have heard, in, I have listened in, in, uh, with great attention to what everyone has said, and I, I heard some points that really made, uh, made my, my heart and my brain uh, tick in, uh, in terms that we do have solutions, we do have things we, uh, we can implement starting today. And uh, I think it's important to, to, to start with, with a, a needs assessment, a wide ranging needs assessment that uh, WeGate is already, of course, uh, doing. I think we need to put our ear uh, on the ground and re really listen to, to what women entrepreneurs need, uh, what the difficulties are, and not only in a, a theoretical way and uh, judging by your, our own experiences and the experience of, uh, of women in our microcosms and uh, our you know, uh, limited context, but uh, women entrepreneurs from different walks of life and uh, countries and uh, uh, socioeconomic um, backgrounds, what they really need and what the challenges they face uh, are. Uh, so I think we also need a flexibility of, of the um, uh, financial uh, instruments, the funding instruments that we already have at our disposal, because um, we are um, we are uh, at the moment we are undertaking a gender impact assessment of uh, um, of a women's entrepreneurship initiative in Greece and in Belgium. And what we have found is that there is 
there are issues uh, in, in the ways th those interest instruments are designed. Uh, they have been designed taking into account um, the male life cycle, uh, the more, um, you know, the, the, the needs that society has uh, been used to expect for, from male entrepreneurs. And uh, those needs have to do with, uh, with uh, caretaking needs, uh, have to do with uh, uh, the difference between uh, um, opportunity-based entrepreneurship and needs-based entrepreneurship uh, that we know women are uh, far more inclined to, at least in Greece at the moment. So we need to design more adaptable financial instruments to cater for the, for the needs of female entrepreneurs. And um, we need to also have uh, different reliability criteria that work for, for female entrepreneurs, because we know that we, we, so often uh, financial institutions and funding instruments judge uh, the reliability of entrepreneurs based on their previous um, record or the, um, uh, their, their revenue cycles, their profit cycles. And we know that women don't have those track records. And we know that we need to find and implement uh, different reliability criteria so that we can design more inclusive uh, funding instruments for, for female entrepreneurs. Uh, we also believe that we need to, uh, to, to, to train uh, officers and executives and people working in, uh, in those uh, financial institutions uh, in terms of unconscious bias that can uh, that, that is definitely uh, impacting their uh, their decisions and uh, not only training but also implementing a code of, of, of ethics um, around uh, inclusive funding and inclusive financial instruments and these are um, uh, codes that need to 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 be implemented and designed, co-created by uh, the industry, the, the, the financial industry as a whole, because we need uh, um, financial institutions to, to really get on board and, um, and implement uh, initiatives of stakeholder engagement, stakeholder uh, activism, if you like, and stakeholder um, design in terms of what uh, financial institutions ask and expect from uh, uh, from uh, the the companies they they fund, but what they also expect from their uh, officers, their their executives, their employees in terms of who they fund, who they give access to, and training is is at the heart uh, of of the implementation of this code of ethics. And um, I know, Gabi, that you love to say, and I, I fully agree with that, that it's the system we need to fix and not the women. But uh, what we have seen at uh, Women on Top is that training and mentoring uh, in terms of uh, uh, how uh, women um, take, you know, how, how women leverage their, their access, their existing access to, uh, to finance and funding. Um, I think this is an important step we need to take. Uh, we need to train women in, in, in any, uh, I, I loved what Lynn said about alternative, uh, alternatives to pitching, but we definitely need to, to train women who have not been socially uh, trained and acculturated to, um, uh, taking advantage of the, the, the access they have to, to those instruments and those institutions. So we have to train uh, women who are not uh, accustomed to networking, to pitching, to public speaking, to business planning. We do need to have systematic training on these topics, not uh, uh, one-off trainings, not small-scale trainings. We need to train all women, all young women and older women to um, to be able to to access those opportunities, and I think mentoring uh, has a great part to, to to play in this. At the moment, we are at Women on Top. We are running our first crowdfunding campaign to build a mentoring platform that will enable us to mentor women uh, efficiently and effectively uh, from all over Europe, not just uh, Greece. Uh, so we really believe that this exchange of information and, and experiences can really make a difference in the way that women access uh, funding for their, um, for their uh, budding or, or scaling enterprises. So thanks for listening to, to me. Um, 
I hope uh, I hope this this discussion also needs to concrete steps that we can all take uh, to to promote female entrepreneurship in in Europe and the world, uh, if I may. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stella, very much for pointing out the importance of mentoring, the importance of uh, building skills. Definitely, that is something that is that is relevant uh, alongside with, with fixing the system. Of course, we also have to be to be sure that we are providing the right assistance for the for the skills development. There is one when very short follow up question about the mentoring program that you mentioned at the end. Is it uh, going to be a women only mentoring program, Stella? Or is going to be for for entrepreneurs in it general. It is. It is just for women. We we create uh, women on the spaces uh, in in women on top. We don't uh, discount the the need for uh, um, intergender uh, mentoring, but we focus on women so that we can create safe and brave spaces that women can exchange their experiences uh, pertaining also to their gender at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It will be very. Uh, we, will, we will definitely follow up on that. We, will, we are very much interested in the uh, in the lessons learned from 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 uh, mentoring programs for for women, so that we can we can have uh, the right suggestions when it comes to improving this type of support programs and instruments. And of course, what we plan to do as mentoring inside of the VGA. Thank you very much, Stella, for this. I just wanted to to, to have one short question to Malin, Cheryl, Stella, however you prefer. It doesn't matter. Just a quick a quick answer what do you think about innovation financing uh, how do we stand with innovation financing uh, you touched upon a little bit you we, we, we talked about the the, the, the the trap of scalability we talked about uh, the criteria and flexibility in uh, in funding public funding programs but uh, do we need to change something there how do we treat innovation what do we consider innovation for for, for ourselves I just wanted to a quick, quick uh, uh, input from your side on, on innovation financing. That is also a very, very large area of interest of mine. So thank you. So Cheryl, Lynn, Stella, whomever you. I, I'm still trying to figure out what innovation financing means. So I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. To me, it just sounds like more jargon and more barriers to mm -hmm. entry. Okay, yeah, that is exactly what the same feeling I had. So, 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 so let's skip it then, and let's move on to our next, uh, to our last, uh, last session, uh, and uh, talk about digital transformation. Uh, I would like to to start. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of this part, the final part, is to to discuss a little bit whether there is a difference in 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 the opportunities, challenges related to digital skills. What needs to be done? What organization has to be has to do? What are the benefits? How the how women entrepreneurs can explore uh, the the digital transformation uh, for their own benefit? And I think that uh, um, I would just start by introducing some uh, some of our uh, next guests. Uh, we have with us here Erisa Erisa. She is the policy advisor with SME United. SME United is a large employers organization, so it does not represent only the interest of women entrepreneurs, but of employers. And that is a very interesting, interesting uh, perspective in our in our work because we do want to have these different perspectives in what we do. And uh, she, uh, she is following on uh, on trade policies, on single market policies, so uh, very, very likely. And uh, she is also following on the digital market uh, policies. So it will be very interesting to hear uh, what Erisa, Erisa as, a, as a policy advisor within SM United has to share with us. So Erisa, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Gabriela, for this introduction and for the event invitation. Uh, I'm happy to join the event today and share with you the views of SM United on women entrepreneurship and digitalization. Um, so digitalization is key for future growth, and it brings with it opportunities and challenges. The current health crisis and economic crisis as well is accelerating this trend and it is showing that it is essential the digital transition is it understood in order uh, to be used in a way that builds on its opportunities while limiting negative consequences. We have seen that data, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, internet of things are becoming economic assets for women entrepreneurs and also for SMEs at large. As you all know, SMEs are at the backbone uh, of the European economy. In the EU, we have around 25 million uh, SMEs, uh, which represents 67% of total employment. 
At SME United, we have gathered national best practices to support women entrepreneurship. And we have observed that in certain national contexts, um, women still experience difficulties related to the uptake of digitalization. For instance, in Greece, women are to an, to an extremely large extent absent from ICT startups. To overcome this digital gap, it is extremely important to promote awareness raising activities on how women can identify which digital skills are needed to perform their activities and how to acquire those skills. We believe that the role of SME organizations uh, is very important in informing women entrepreneurs what is already available at European and national level. Uh, many SME United members um, have specific committees dedicated to the promotion of women entrepreneurship. They offer support uh, in different business phases such as, such as seed growth and consolidation. At the European level, worth mentioning is the support offered by digital innovation hubs and the European Enterprise Network. As, was, as it was highlighted this morning by Ms. Schreiber, uh, in its SME strategy, the Commission has announced that it will launch uh, a digital volunteers program enabling young skilled people and experienced seniors to share their digital competencies with traditional businesses. The Commission will also support uh, digital crash courses for SME employees to become proficient in areas such as AI and cybersecurity. We believe that for these channels to be effective, um, they need to be, uh, let's say, new institutions need to team up with SME organizations to provide specific know-how on digital transformation. In order to achieve a higher level of inclusion of women entrepreneurs in the digital area, we also highlight the importance of networks. This contributes also to the empowerment of those women entrepreneurs who aim to internationalize their business. I'd like to mention again the role of EEN and SME organizations in offering support, mentoring, and networking activities, such as, for instance, pitch lunches where female entrepreneurs lecture and inspire other women. SME United believes that the collaboration of clusters with an ICT focus and SME organizations is beneficial to promote partnerships in sectors of interest by facilitating brainstorming on innovative digital solutions. In order to create a facilitating environment that supports the digital transition, we also believe that the development uh, of a well-functioning and safe infrastructure such as a broadband connection is necessary. In addition, financial incentives will be key in this regard. This could include several schemes, such as um, support for the investment in equipment or vouchers for a diagnostic exercise by qualified consultants to identify the digitalization needs of companies and to help them to prepare uh, an action plan on how um, they want to expand their online business. Last but not least, we also think that women entrepreneurs and uh, more broadly SMEs should be enabled to work in an appropriate regulatory environment um, where they can compete on fair grounds vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, international competitors and bigger players. Uh, for this reason, we look at the upcoming Commission's proposals on the Digital Services Act, the Data Act and the rules on artificial intelligence. Uh, to conclude, um, SME United believes that the empowerment uh, of women in the digital transition um, is key for their success in the European single market and beyond. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Arisa, for pointing out the importance of, uh, of, the, of the service providers, uh, of the ones that are involved in the, in, the, in the IT service provisioning and the different instruments that can be available, like the vouchers, in order to, uh, to support the digital transformation of, of women entrepreneurs. And we are very much looking forward to the different programs that you just mentioned that will be launched in the area of digital transformation. And in fact, we have a request from, from Amelie in, in the chat if we can share the links to this program. So maybe we can follow up after the event and, and share these this links to, to our participants of, of the programs that will come concerning the, the digital transformation that you mentioned uh, and organized by the European Commission. Now we have, uh, I've been informed that we have a very, very little time I have, so we will just need to, to, to speed up a little bit. Sorry for that. And uh, I, will, I would like to invite uh, Giulia uh, Kinici from, uh, from APID, uh, from Italy, uh, uh, 
women's entrepreneurship organization um, uh, being there for, for many years now to share with us her points of view uh, how we can improve the conditions concerning digital transformation for women entrepreneurs julia hello and hello. the floor is yours hi hi Hi, hi. Thank you for the introduction, Gabriela, and good morning. So what, what needs to be done for the digital transformation? I think that first of all, we, we need to solve the infrastructural problem. Unfortunately, there is a still lack of uh, broadband, ultra broadband and high speed connection. So in this case, you see that um, policies are really important and connected uh, with the entre entrepreneurial environment and they are crucial to overcome any digital gap. Then I think that we have to organize a, a more friendly approach to digital transformation. As it is mostly unknown, digital transformation can, can scare us somehow. So we need a kind of gentle push with a sort of digital path for women entrepreneurs. And in this case, you see that, that we need a bottom-up approach for digital transformation. But as we have uh, different uh, levels of digitalization, we also need a different action to be taken. So for example, in micro and small enterprises, an approach with digital mentor can be easily organized. And the mentor, for example, has the right knowledge, uh, the right networks, uh, and she uh, can easily create the necessary empathy uh, to design specific uh, project um, uh, on digital transformation for your, for your enterprise. While in bigger enterprises, the role of research centers is uh, crucial. I'm, I'm talking about a really close connection where researchers, devices, data and studies can help, really can help the management to visualize uh, uh, the change and the progress the enterprises can make with the digital transformation. In both cases, I mentioned a really close collaboration between uh, association and networks um, and chamber of commerce can speed, uh, can speed the process. So basically, association like ours uh, uh, must create uh, action and project where the first beneficiaries are women entrepreneurs, absolutely. But uh, as we know, uh, women entrepreneurs are mostly concentrated in uh, services and commerce. We need to figure out uh, some solution for, for them as well. And this, this can be the digital approach. So an experience for your client based both on the physical and the digital methodologies is the use of technology to build a bridge between the physical and the digital uh, dimension. You can create a very strong customer experience, even if you are an artisan. And look here, I'm not talking about big investment, but it's a really new approach for doing business uh, and sell your product abroad. And then uh, last, uh, mm, I think that talking about digital skills, uh, mm, the issue is really, but really to have the same access to digitalization. It's not the lack of digital competencies, it's really the lack of equal opportunity. It's the fact, unfortunately, that still two um, strong stereotype, stereotypes uh, address women to specific careers and not to STEM uh, careers or to entrepreneurial ones. And here we need to, um, to have role models for girls and women and uh, stronger public services for families, uh, a new approach in education or learning, learning by doing processes since uh, the very, very first stage of education. So here again, you can see how digital transformation is strictly connect, connected to a cultural transformation. I know that it's not uh, an easy way, but uh, I can see already the happening in, uh, in young generation. So we need to really work together to, to keep uh, the things going on. I think that my four minutes are gone. <laughs> Thanks again for having me. I, I tried to summarize very, very, thank you very yeah. much. Thank, thank you, Julia. You really, you really pointed out several very important aspects, starting from the infrastructure that we still have to work on the infrastructure because uh, and the accessibility to, 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 to support for digital skills, but also the broadband and what you mentioned, and also how do we perceive digital skills, and uh, does not always necessarily mean that. Uh, um, 
it's it's all about artificial intelligence and things like that. I, I don't have anything against it. In fact, it's my it's my area of expertise. But I also understand it's about turning digital opportunities uh, into a benefit for your business. It does not. So so we also have to work on that as well. So so many different aspects that we need to we need to address when it comes to digital digital skills and how to how to bring them them closer to our community. So thank you, Julia, once again. I would now like to introduce you uh, our next uh, speaker. It's Yolima. Yolima, I'm sorry, but I, I really I really have a difficulty in pronouncing your last name. So 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 you can uh, uh, you can you're free to, to introduce yourself. It's, uh, she's the co-founder of the Berg Mortel. Uh, here. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> that is that is the uh, the what community in in action, <laughs> supporting each other. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, so she's the co-founder of the International Creative Women based in Netherlands, and uh, uh, this is a very interesting organization because it does represent and supports uh, uh, small creative uh, business of so women, but also supports women coming from different countries. So. Uh, trying to kick off their careers in a different ecosystem, in a different country, not uh, facing additional challenges, but not, not knowing the language, not knowing the system itself. So this is very, very important to have this perspective, considering that we are all moving somewhere uh, uh, ac across the world. So this is very important to have in our community as well. And Yulima, she is a biolog biologist and entrepreneur, of course, and she has more than 15 years of experience in creating businesses and as a small entrepreneurs consultant and we are very happy to have you Yulima in the council and on the, on the session today and looking forward to hearing from you on the digital transformation points of view. Thank you Gabriela, it's a pleasure to be here and I would like to point a few things that uh, has been uh, mentioned before but um, it's about the concept that we tend to have about digital transformation as you mentioned we think to we tend to think that is about intelligent uh, artificial intelligence and big scale apps and um in a in a very high level but digital transformation is also for micro businesses for small and uh, also in the creative industries is uh, very important that the women get the right tools, the knowledge, but also the funding for this uh, digital transformation. And this has to be according to the scale of their business. It's not the same for a solopreneur or a big scale up uh, to implement different strategies. So it's important that we consider the moment because COVID-19 has been an accelerator for digital transformation for many companies and the ones who were more prepared or ready to transform were um, tend to survive or tend to do better than the ones who were not. Uh, in our experience in the Netherlands uh, during the, the first couple of months of the pandemic, we had to push the companies and the small businesses to be online and to start moving their uh, in-person business to digital, to online, to start not only selling services, but uh, products, but also services in an online way. And that was uh, very difficult because um, creativity doesn't match always technology. So is uh, regarding the skills, it's important to take into account that it's necessary to have the competences and the skills necessary to do that. And it's uh, uh, leading with the fear or with the lack of knowledge that is, uh, yes, it's possible. It's possible for me, it's also possible for my creative business, it's possible for my small business or micro business to implement a digital transformation strategy and uh, be competitive when you can use the technology, uh, you can increase your profit, you can increase a, a, or make it more efficient and optimize your business operations and create valuable data. Uh, one of the things that uh, we need to create is a systematic training on the importance of data. And the women need to start gathering data and use it for their benefit. So um, I want to recommend or suggest that we can create a, a toolkit for digital transformation uh, 
in accordance of the different level, the levels of the business for different women entrepreneurs or different uh, industries. But it's really, really important that the women know that it's possible to do it and how they are going to do it and they start doing it with the small actions, with the thought of a bigger, bigger uh, image or a, or a complete strategy, but the small actions can be done today to start that digital transformation. So I invite everybody to start um, thinking about how we're going to uh, create this toolkit that can be easily shared and, and uh, implement in a cheaper way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lima. Thank you very much for, 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 for sharing the, uh, the importance of having resources at hand. So I like the idea of having a, a toolkit or, or, or certain certain resources that we can we can offer to, to women entrepreneurs uh, for their journey towards digital transformation. I will definitely have a closer look at that and see how we can we can we can build upon on already existing resources or maybe design something new. Why not? Uh, something that will be really uh, in line with the needs of women entrepreneurs. And just referring to what was said previously by, by Stella that if we want to design something that we should take into account the, the needs of women entrepreneurs and uh, we have been doing the Vibarometer, but Vibarometer uh, uh, is, is a live uh, is a live survey. So maybe 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 next year we can we can also think about including more emphasis on digital transformation. So collecting more information in that sense. But in any case, as Thomas uh, mentioned in the previous panel, uh, we should really seek for wider outreach of this uh, of this barometer so that uh, we should seek for assistance maybe from different networks like the SMN Envoys Network or, or something like that in order to have more and more women entrepreneurs participating because only by having this data, as you mentioned, uh, Yulima, the importance of data, the, the wider outreach we have with the, with the barometer, it will be the, the more representative data we will have. So thank you very much. We will definitely look into that possibilities. And now we, uh, as we approach by the end of, of our of our uh, session, I would like to invite uh, uh, two more two more speakers. But first, we start with Nicoleta uh, Monteanu. She's the vice president of CONAP, the National Confederation of Female Entrepreneurs. Uh, this is a reference institution for supporting women and entrepreneurs in Romania. Uh, she herself has her own company, uh, a background in, in, in law, uh, participates in many different initiatives. So uh, as for all our uh, panelists, if you would like to learn a little bit more about them, you, then you have all the different resources online. So just in the interest of time, Nicoletta, please, uh, the floor is yours. We are very, very much interested in hearing your perspective as a vice president of national association. What can we do for the digital transformation? First of all, I would like Gabriela to thank you for the invitation. I am honored to be here with all of you in the, this uh, global challenging moment for us. And in the same time, I would like to thank the world organizer, uh, the organizers who have done an excellent job. Um, I have listened with all interests uh, the speeches. All the speeches are very interesting. And um, um, uh, when we are talking about the um, uh, digital transformation. Um, I'm thinking about the global study, study that shows us that there is a discrepancy between employees' uh, current competencies and the employers' needs generated by the new technology. Um, uh, the society and the economy are transforming at an unusual rhythm to the uh, to, uh, technology. So it is obvious that the technology is the cause of the transformation, but in the same time, it is the cause uh, also uh, represent a significant part of the solution. Um, in order to identify the new digital competencies designed to meet the challenges of women entrepreneurs, we must understand what are the five global mega trends. And here I mean technological discoveries, automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence that will significantly impact the labor market because there is a risk that the new technology will generate uh, social unrest if the economy benefits are not shared equitably. Uh, social and demographic changes, the fast urbanization, the UN estimates that 
4.9 billion people will live in city by 2030. The changes of the global uh, economic power through the disappearance of the middle class and uh, of the jobs that will be replaced by automation and developed countries. Um, the climate changes and the natural resources, uh, we know that the energy and the water demand will increase up by to uh, 15 and 15% uh, and 40% respectively by 2030. So let's not neglect the fact that the uh, traditional energy industries and the million of people will be affected. So given all these global trends, I, I believe that there is a need for a mix of sophisticated cognitive skills related to emotional and social intelligence. And because the digital age requires digital education, I believe that women entrepreneurs need educational program to help them uh, understand the digital skills in order for them to be integrated and active uh, in the digital world, um, upscaling program through which we understand how to use advantage uh, technologies both at work and in uh, everyday life, and of course professional retraining programs to respond uh, to the challenges of the economy and to reduce the employment generated by the automation process. Um, when I'm thinking about the tools that we needed to create it, the digital ecosystem, I'm thinking about infrastructure. So we need network access and the access speed a smart home solution, smart contracts, blockchain must take into account the disruptive technologies. Education and infrastructure cannot generate value without the people or companies that um, uh, use it. And of course, the government policy to limit the risk faced by a society on its um, way to a digital economy uh, economy um, in uh, in terms of uh, of the uh, founding solution the european framework in the european uh, framework the companies feel a lack on an ecosystem um, in which they can thrive um, in the context of the unique digital market companies must make the most of the potential offered by the digital agenda of the member states um, uh, the main financing resource for the smes and for the micro uh, companies also is the bank loan. Uh, the new companies hardly get financing at the beginning of the activity. In this sense, there is a need to support a business ecosystem for SMEs, for micro companies, by supporting a framework regarding to uh, regarding the venture capital uh, and the uh, entrepreneurship funds. Uh, I'm thinking about alternative uh, funding can uh, take uh, the form of financial support for testing and piloting the new technology. Uh, venture capital, private investment, and business incubators. Um, I'm thinking about in the same time to the um, facility to support the transfer of the company because annually about 4, uh, 450,000 companies are transferred on the territory of the Europe in which 2 million employee works. So the difficulty lies in the transfer method, the smallest enterprise being exposed to fail transfer so the transfer should be facilitated both for the entrepreneur who wants to uh, transfer the business and for the one who take it over um, I thinking about also uh, creating warranty programs dedicated to startup uh, financing for innovation and tax deduction for research and development um, I'm thinking about uh, to customize the consulting program to support information and education system to provide support in the various stage of development of, sub uh, of startups. Such program can ensure online trainings like uh, development skills. And um, also I'm thinking about the alternative resources of financing, which are provided by investment funds uh, with regional and uh, venture capital. Um, in conclusion, because I know that it, uh, I have the sure <laughs> that uh, companies cannot longer be competitive if they do not adopt a digital technologies. Um, digital entrepreneurs are the ones who fully take advantage of the digital products and services in order to reinvent uh, the own model, or the own business models, and increase their competitiveness.
Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for, Nicoletta, for, for pointing out very, one very important aspect, uh, because we talked about the possibilities of using uh, digital tools for making online sales, for, for turning around your business. Uh, we also mentioned the disruptive technologies, but you, you also mentioned a uh, uh, couple of important things like the knowledge gaps and, and where it all starts, uh, how we should address the, uh, the, 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 the digital uh, skills gap. So thank you very much. We will definitely uh, have a closer look to all the suggestions. And I personally very much like what you mentioned that it is also about digital strategy for a company. Do we have a digital strategy? What does a digital strategy mean for, means for me as a small woman entrepreneur? So definitely a lot of lot of different things that we need to explore if we want to provide very concrete uh, concrete policy brief on the topic afterwards, because this is this is uh, well, part of part of the discussion that of course will continue after the summits in our regular after the summit in our regular work. And uh, I would just like to to ask Cheryl, uh, considering that. Uh, digital transformation is indeed uh, indeed what uh, she is devoted for many many years now and what digital leadership is institute is renowned for that so just to 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 give us a couple of additional thoughts on the topic of digital transformation so that we can have something even something more to to, to think about so Cheryl please the floor is yours Thank you Gabriela and thank you to all of uh, these amazing uh, um, perspectives that I feel, you know, I'm not sure how much I can add to the discussion, except maybe to, to step back um, at an arm's length, um, because our organization, we say that we promote esteem skills to girls and women, and this is really the focus of our work, plus we do awareness building and advocacy and a lot of other things, but at the heart of our work is really um, skills development. And esteem, as you probably all know about STEM, um, the new term is STEAM, where you add in the, the, the A for arts. So we talk about the intersection of, of STEM and, um, and creative invention. And our organization puts the E for entrepreneurship on the front. And we talk about promoting esteem skills to girls and women. And why do we do that is um, because women are really at the crux of this intersection of we are not entrepreneurs and we don't have digital skills. Um, and this is like a double whammy when we see what the pandemic has created um, as far as this very steep learning curve for getting everyone online and no one is discussing, even discussing how much of an impact, how much more difficult, how much steeper a learning curve this has been for women. Um, but flipped around, we can, we can look at that as an opportunity because we are on that learning curve. We're actually moving up that learning curve. And um, it may be a positive spin to put on uh, the pandemic that we are, all have become more digitally versatile, more digitally skilled than perhaps we were when this nightmare started. Um, but I would still like to just bring us back to, we've talked a lot about the entrepreneurship angle, but just to understand a bit how far behind women are, women and girls are in leading in the digital society. And a lot of you who, with whom I've had the opportunity to work know these issues. You've also faced them um, on the ground yourselves and with the women that you're trying to support. But I would just like to remind you that in the face of all of this disruption trans transformation that Nicoletta has just outlined really beautifully, um, it's really important to understand that the participation of women as leaders in the digital transformation has flatlined. And there are some very key indicators that I personally look at. One, yes, there's a problem with broadband access, but hello, it is not a problem in Europe compared to the rest of the world. We are very, very fortunate in Europe and in, in the US, in North America. However, to Julia's point, if there is someone who is not getting access, it's much more likely that that person is a woman, including in Europe, okay? It's much worse in the rest of the world. 
So that's very important to bear in mind. Even in Europe today, a woman has less access to the internet, less access to digital tools, period. She is more likely to be to have no or low digital skills compared to a man. Far less likely to be an IT expert. And that has a big impact on invention and on um, innovation and on startup. So kind of going back to that question of the innovation uh, financing, yes, we are not receiving that money because simply we are not there. We are not there in STEM. We're definitely not there in tech. And as a corollary to all that, so it's an ecosystem that is really damning, damning for women. Um, we are not doing IT startup. So I, I start to get, I start to bristle a bit when we talk about SMEs and we talk about the number of women SME leaders, which, you know, that's also a slide I always refer to. 16 to 24% of, of SME owners are women. Um, Less than 29% of all our entrepreneurs are women. 34.4% of the EU self-employed are women. 30% of, uh, of women are in startups, but how many women are in tech startup? We don't even have a good number on this. Some people say 5% in Europe, some people say 15%. So I say 10%. And what does that mean? It's more like an indicator of the health of the ecosystem, right? So we know that we don't have women-led tech enterprises. And women in the middle of a digital disruption, if we don't have women who are starting digital enterprises, we are in deep doo-doo. And that's only one part of the problem. The other part is, so th there we're really talking about digital expert skills, okay? And to underscore the, the problem, I said that um, our participation has flatlined. Since, as long as I've been tracking this question, since 2005, the number of IT experts in the European ecosystem has skyrocketed at a rate that's seven times, seven to eight times the rest of the workforce. So, you know, if you wanna get a good job or you tell your kids to get good high paying jobs, you tell them to do tech. And in some countries, there are more women doing that in other countries of Europe, like Romania and Bulgaria, thank goodness. But the rest of Europe is a disaster. Um, so we tell, so, so that the demand for those jobs is skyrocketing. The number of people who are filling those jobs is, is following the same trend. However, in 2015, so these are, no, 2018, 84% of those jobs is being filled by men. Um, and the actual number of women as a proportion of, you know, relative, um, number of women IT experts has actually dropped in that same time frame, from 22% of the workforce to just 16.5% of the workforce. So think about, and this has not changed even with the, the digital disruption. So highly troubling. That's digital experts. And then you have just, um, I make the distinction between digitally driven enterprise. So the example that I just gave, you know, uh, female IT experts starting, starting a company and scaling it and et cetera. But we know that, especially the, the, the situation that Lo Yolima has, has mentioned, but I'm sure that you've all um, experienced this, getting the p local pizza shop to go online. You know, this has always been my example. You get they get so much more, more customers. There's a big difference between the pizza shop and pizza.com, right? Um, this has really been made abundantly clear by the pandemic. Yes, everyone now needs to be online. But the fact that women don't, are, you know, are more likely to have no or low digital skills also means just for them to start up. You know, we all know we need a website. We might need a smartphone app. We, just for them to start up, there is a, an impediment um, that I don't think is being 
sufficiently addressed, not in the um, startup ecosystem, certainly not in programs that are trying to reach and increase that supply chain of women entrepreneurs. Like I was saying, increase the, the number of women doing startup in, in that pipeline. So it's not only the nature of the startup that we're doing, but it's also to have access to loan programs where everything you, where you have to do everything online, where you have to apply. You might even need a minimum viable product of your gadget in order to qualify for funding, including at the European Commission level. Um, so there's not only the fact that we need some minimum of digital skills to, be, to bring our product or our service to our target market, but we also need some digital skills to take advantage of, you know, e-commerce, e e-commerce platforms, or, or like I said, um, um, funding schemes, or um, even accelerators, and um, a lot of other opportunities that women are technically missing out on. So I think um, I don't want to belabor the point any longer, but what our real objective should be is that these two, that, that women-led enterprise and digital enterprise by women become synonymous because they really are, except in very few circumstances now. And that we are also increasing the skills and the funding and the research to get women doing digitally driven startup. And that's a whole nother discussion. But as DLI, we are engaged in those topics and anything, I mean, personally, I think that it would be really great for all the parties of this discussion to get together and to get into some programs where we can really deploy our expertise um, to the advantage of our benefactors. So thank you, Gabriela. And thank you all for this amazing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for pointing out so many important things. And we will definitely organize a follow-up sessions where we are going to discuss all those different aspects and then share with our audience many of, our, of the things that we have talked today. We are going to summarize and share it with the Wegate community. Uh, but of course, we will follow up later on with more uh, thematic approach, with more in-depth uh, either press releases or policy briefs. I would like to thank all of the panelists. I would like to, all, to thank all the attendees that have stayed with us till the, till the end. I'm sorry that we have entered a little bit in your lunchtime break, but I hope that you enjoyed and that you were inspired as much as I was inspired. And at the same time, I invite you to take the advantage of all the following workshops and uh, that, that that will happen during the day. And of course, come and join the Vigate community and see how we can all together work on different aspects in improving the ecosystem. So thank you very much once again. And uh, until next time, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, bye all. So long. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, I just want to remind you that this afternoon we still have some uh, workshops taking place. It's time for you to get your skills upskilled and join the workshops under the eLearn uh, sessions, you will have all received your links to your uh, relevant workshops, so please check your emails. Uh, and uh, thank you, Gabriella. Thank you to the entire panel. I absolutely enjoyed listening to you. I learned so much and I could have gone on for hours and hours. And in my mind, this is sort of what a town hall meeting would look like if it were all run by women. So thank you ever so much for the most uh, amazing and inspiring conversations. And we'll see you all back uh, at your workshop sessions at two o'clock. <laughs>